Um, Metis is a research and evaluation consulting firm in New York City. Uh, I'm actually located in Columbus, Ohio, so I telecommute. Um, and we do research and evaluation with school districts, states, nonprofits, uh, focusing on anything having to do with children and families. But we also do data management uh, and grant development. So those are our three big areas. Uh, and I mostly focus on education and specifically educational technology initiatives. And then, you know, like what's, maybe you can just talk, what's an interesting project that you've worked on over the last couple of years? Uh, it's, it, uh, from an ed tech perspective, I've worked on several one-to-one -one initiatives, uh, mm -hmm. which I find interesting all over the country. Uh, one's in New York City, one's in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, Las Vegas. Uh, and they really have a lot of uh, interesting findings. I'm not necessarily a big proponent of one-to-one -one initiatives per se, uh, but the ways in which technology are used. And I'm seeing a lot uh, of things related to STEM computational thinking um, mm -hmm. that are taking us kind of beyond the traditional pop a device in front of a kid and see what happens, which is one of the things that led me to my, some of my thoughts tonight. Um, because I'm seeing, you know, in many school districts, there's that pressure to increase achievement and so they turn to technology in different ways which i'm a huge proponent of i love educational technology uh, but you have to provide all the infrastructure and supports around it in order to really use it well along the kind of passive active continuum now you know we were talking a little bit earlier and you were saying that um your kids aren't always happy with you about the way you restrict their use of, of technology sometimes yeah yeah, um, I do a lot of that. Uh, it's not necessarily, I, restrict is such a, a negative word. Right, uh, I right. talk about our family, about having balance uh, and that, uh, you know, one one day I, I was looking at my kid and he'd spent like an inordinate number of hours on the, the worst game of all time, Fortnite. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, just a game <laughs> that a lot of boys seem to really be drawn to lately uh, across the country. and. And I, he had all these hours and finally he, he just couldn't, I just said, let's just talk about this. Let's talk about balance. And finally I said, Ben, let's put it in perspective. How many hours did you spend reading this week? <laughs> How many hours did you spend playing basketball, your favorite pastime? And we could try to put it in perspective about um, it's the same, you know, you eat some sugar, not all sugar and, uh, and whatnot. And then there's different uses. So mm -hmm. he said, well, I use it for schoolwork. And I said, well, that's different. Um, than, you know, watching YouTube videos of other kids playing video games. Uh, there's mm -hmm. different types of use uh, and the things that you can do. So we talk a lot about that in our family. So, you know, so I mean, what, I th what I think I'm going to do is let's, let me just move. Um, well, act before I move to the first slide, we started this, be, you know, where, where you and I were talking about a backlash that, um, that, teachers were often hearing from parents, why are you having our kids use technology? And, you know, where, where did you hear about that? How did, you know, how did that start in our conversation? Because I don't think that I was one who brought it up. I think you're the one who first brought it up, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I was observing when I, you know, I, I live, I'm really lucky to live where I live. I live, live in a fabulous community with great schools. Um, and it's diametrically different, opposed to some of the schools and, and communities that, that I work with. Um, mm -hmm. And in terms of the, the amount of opportunities that, that kids have, uh, not the mm -hmm. amount of love parents have, not any of that, but like the amount of opportunities that are afforded right. these children. Um, and so I, I was seeing that and I was wondering about the backlash because what I'm seeing are two kind of parallel narratives about technology and education and where we need to go. Uh, mm -hmm. And I and I say parallel because I really, I think they run parallel to each other. They're not necessarily touching, although I think they should. Um, and the first one, I mean, without going into the slides, the first one is really about uh, the idea that technology is essential to the growth of our country, to our children. Uh, you know, we need STEM education. We, you know, the jobs that our kids are going to have someday in the future are things that haven't even been invented. You know, that whole kind of narrative around mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the economic future and, you know, the, the digital economy and all of that. Um, so I see all of that. And then I see all of the stuff related to a digital divide and how if we don't give these opportunities to children and families, they're not going to have money and our, our country is going to go to heck in a handbasket and all of that. But then I see the second narrative, which is 
technology is detrimental to our children. It's overwhelming our culture. It's overwhelming our families. Uh, we have to limit it. We have to stop our children. And I have all these statistics, which I'm not going to read to you right now. Um, and these mm -hmm. studies focusing on, you know, impacts on, you know, social emotional learning and attention problems and uh, for, you know, everything from 18 month old kids all the way through college right. kids. So I have all of this mm -hmm. stuff that which I'm not going to talk about right now, but I see these two narratives and I'm wondering what is happening with them uh, and what it means to then be a teacher in a school. So do, you know, when you're in one school, do, do you have kind of parents asking you to do one thing in another school? Do you have parents kind of asking you to do something different? I mean, my opinion is that both are right, that it's, it's about what you do and how you do it. Um, not necessarily about the devices themselves, but mm -hmm. uh, that's that's kind of what I'm seeing, and I'm feeling like there could be a backlash against ed tech um, as we move forward. So, when we were talking about putting this together, you kind of you constructed like questions that we might want to consider, and so I have those on the screen. Do you want to? And maybe I'll just even uh, for the recording, um, I'll make them even you know larger. Um, okay. Do you want to just go through, you know, sure. why are these the right questions? I don't know that they're the right the questions. They're the oh. questions that I'm interested in. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that there's a lot, there's tons of research out there about what technology uh, is, what it says about technology and children, you know, going way back to Sherry Turkle kind of stuff, uh, mm -hmm. way back in the dark ages of ed tech, so to speak. Uh, but then there's this whole national narrative. I mean, you have people tweeting all the time and you have kids who are constantly on their devices. Um, and I'm, so I'm curious, those are the two kind of big overarching questions uh, that what is the narrative or what does research say? But then ultimately those three bottom ones are the ones that are most meaningful to me, which is what does all of that do and how does it impact use of technology in schools for teaching and learning? Um, mm -hmm. And what is, you know, when you have parents who are concerned about screen time, but then you also have children who, you know, you have the pressure to personalize and differentiate learning um, and all of those things that technology is really, really good at. Um, and, uh -huh. you know, if you imagine the SAMR model for, for ed tech people, you know that what you want to do is get to that highest level or that, that fourth quadrant of, you know, redefining educational teaching and learning tasks so that they're not just the basic substitution, uh, which is a really rich thing that you can do. So I'm curious about that. And then I really wanted to engage and talk about what we can do to ensure that technology is ultimately used well in schools and what people are seeing being used well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, let's, you know, just move, move along. So that then comes to this slide here, right? That leads, leads right. us into the which divergent. Is my the two narratives, the, the two the two things that cross or don't cross, excuse me, I'm seeing uh -huh. go parallel, which we've already talked a little bit about. And you can go to the next slide, which really talks about um, that technology is essential. It's cost, you know, we have this digital divide and ultimately that today's students are digital natives, which, you know, we all know is the first generation to grow up completely surrounded by technology, uh, completely immersed. It's it's essentially part of their vernacular and their, their lived experience in a way that it isn't necessarily for current teachers. Um, so we have that. And then the second, next slide, which is the second narrative, which is that, oh no, it's not good for our children. Um, we have to limit it for the well being of our children across all age groups for academic reasons and social emotional well being. Um, I would argue that both of these things are, can be true at the same time uh, and that there's ways to uh, leverage the needs from both sides. Uh, but that was what I was hoping we would talk about today. Um, and I, I, I don't know if you want me to read the statistics and, and some of the studies. I've well, yeah, I'd like to, you know, something, cause we're, we're recording this. So, so uh, for the recording, yeah, let's, let's hear some of the statistics and do you want to read them on this slide or would, or should I move? Uh, well, we can go to the previous one. Uh, the, the first narrative, which is, um, you know, one of the big things that I hear are the things related to how essential it is that our children are well versed in technology in order to move our country forward. So, you know, one statistic is that students are 7% more likely to earn a high school and college diploma 
when they're connected to the internet at home and will earn over $2 million more over their lifetimes than children who are not. That's a huge number. Um, an unemployed person who has the internet at home will be employed seven weeks faster than one who does not. And wow. what I thought was really interesting is that every day, according to Deloitte and Touche, every day a person who is not connected to the internet in America, we lose $2.16 of potential economic activity, which means it costs our country $130 million a day. So we hear all of that. And that's related mm -hmm. to of techno uh, internet access, just internet access, which isn't even, I mean, it is a divide and we're going to talk about that, but that's not even wow. a, big, a, a big divider compared to some others. Um, so so I mean, I, a lot of the, the talk about um, technology is about coding, right? It's yes. like kids should know coding, you know, so, yep. so, you know, how does that factor into this in, into this narrative? Um, I think it really does on that first bullet, which is the global digital economy. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you've heard of the four C's, which are, you know, the the um, 21st century skills, which are, you know, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and I forget the fourth C, creativity. Um, so those are four C's, but I'm hearing more about a fifth C, which is computational thinking and related mm -hmm. to code and computer programming. Um, and that you can, it's really essential to kind of move that forward uh, as part of our digital economy. And one of the other uh, statistics I'm gonna, I was gonna talk about here in a minute, but I'm gonna mention now, which is 77% um, of jobs are going to require technology education and background by the year 2020, 77%. That's a huge percentage. And we're only, yeah. that's two years from. <laughs> so I don't know. I think that's an important thing. Um, so obviously it's something that is essential um, and notwithstanding the fact that, you know, technology can really help kids just learn reading and math and social studies and science in really w rich ways. Um, right. So that's kind of that first narrative and, the, and a lot of the data and information that I, I think is kind of outlining that. Um, mm -hmm. but parallel to that is that second narrative. And I can give a little bit of background about that. Um, so for example, the American Academy of Pediatrics in their most recent report suggests that children under 18 months avoid use of screen media entirely, except for video chatting. Um, they think that's good because it can allow kids to communicate with people, you know, like grandparents and, and all of that good stuff. Um, and that children age two to five limit screen use to one hour per day of high quality programming. So what does that say for technology use in pre-K? I don't know. Um, maybe it doesn't necessarily have a place. Uh, Pre-K is a whole different a whole different animal, and it's play-based, and as it should be. Um, but then we have. You no, know, this is going to sound really old-fashioned, and I guess it is. But I I remember growing up, and in, and our family, we could watch um, one hour of TV a day, and we yeah. all and we, I had uh, three sisters we had to all agree on what that was going to be, or we couldn't watch any. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, there, and there, were, there weren't computers the back, you know. That had to happen there. <laughs> right. Yeah. And there was no way to tape or record or. Yeah, that was it. That. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So we had, um, we had an hour of screen time a day. That was it. Yeah. And that's what they're recommending. Uh, and they want it to be high quality. So I, I see that, I, I definitely see the value. So what's high quality? You have to kind of think about what that means. Um, a, another study by, you know, that came out in pediatrics really talks about the exposure to uh, television and video games. They did it together and that it's associated for, you know, middle-aged children with greater attention problems. Uh, and that kind of remained constant across media type and age, which is middle child, age childhood or late adolescent, early adult. Um, mm -hmm. So. You know, that's not shocking when I explain to my own son about, you know, sometimes I'll see him um, playing a video game and then his phone is over here and then he has, you know, another screen over here and he's constantly toggling back and forth through all these things and his brain can do it. But the truth is, is that then their, ba their brains start to expect that and need it, that constant input. So that when we're mm -hmm. driving around in the car and he says, I have nothing to do. And I say, look out the window, that's like debilitating. Um, right. So the whole nother thing.
Um, uh, so, um, and and I think that you know the other thing is when you look, and I guess we'll get into this a little bit later. But let's say technology is is detrimental. You know, when the when the kids are doing well, it, young, they're not really doing Snapchat, but you know, Snapchat right. is not. Um, it is is I mean it's screen time, but it's not the same thing. It's just constant access to your friends. It's just another way to communicate yeah. with your friends. Right, and and Snapchat is a whole nother animal because it's not just constant access. It's this kind of weird scenario where things appear and then disappear. But do they really disappear? And um, and what does that mean? Which really is it's really great for my the next little stat I found, which is came out in the. Clinic, the Clinical Psychology Science Journal, which found mm -hmm. increased time spent with, top, with electronic devices like cell phones, tablets, et cetera, can have an uptick, contribute to symptoms of depression and suicidal thoughts, especially among teen girls. Um, hmm. This is particularly interesting given, you know, we're gonna watch a short video here in a little bit uh, about social media and impacts. And we see a lot about boys and video games and girls and social media. Not that they don't always, they don't ever cross over, but there's, right. um, there's, there's, they both, there's, they both use both. They both use both. Um, uh -huh. but there seems to be a little bit more focus, uh, for each gender in those different areas. So that's kind of, those are the two big narratives that I'm seeing. And I'm curious, you know, what sort of things have been observed, you know, what you've observed when you work with youth and schools and, and nonprofits and all of that. Well, one of the things that's interesting is, again, with this is um, these tools allow adults who are really schooled in manipulation to have direct access to manipulating the kids. And the example, and, it, and it's, it's to a certain extent, it may not be fair to, to pick on Snapchat, but you know, Snapchat has this thing about the number of days that you've communicated with somebody. Well, people, you know, marketing people and manipulate, manipulation people have thought about that a lot. And there's a lot of pressure now on kids like, oh my gosh, I have these three friends. I haven't, I haven't Snapchatted with them today. I'm going to break the chain. It's, you know, yeah. I've, I've, I, it's 65 days in a row. I can't be the one who destroys it. And so it, yeah. it's, um, it's, I don't know if it's fair to call them addictive behaviors, uh, but it's definitely oh, manipulative. Yeah. And we're, and we're giving kids, uh, we're giving adults direct access to kids to manipulate them in ways that may not uh, that are very likely not healthy for the kids well it's really interesting you bring that up because one of the things we were going to talk about later but we can bring it up now is there's a big push among uh technology gurus technology executives against this whole thing um in fact in february a group of former facebook and google employees began a campaign to change that um, and they, it's called the truth about tech and they, you know, the common sense media folks, and they created a new organization called the center for humane technology specifically mm -hmm. are working to make products less addictive for children. Um, mm -hmm. and they said it's an interesting quote. They said, what began as a race to monetize our attention, um, is mm -hmm. now eroding the pillars of our society, mental health, democracy, social relationships, and our children. Um, and there's a whole push for this. That's part of the backlash. You'll see like people in Silicon Valley, they don't want their kids to ever be on it <laughs> or on any well, technology. Um, so, and I'm gonna just, you know, so I'm going to, what I'm going to do for a second is because I see we have a couple new people who have just joined us. I'm going to change the, the full screen for a second to just explain a little bit about uh, the Shindig platform that we're using because hopefully you attending will want to participate in, in, the, in the conversations. So if you look at the screen, you'll see, you know, we're up here on what, what I call the stage. Um, but you see that there's avatars of other people on the screen, especially if I temporarily uh, make the screen, you know, the, the, the slides smaller. But um, in addition to that, underneath your avatar or next to your avatar is a menu. And one of the ways that you can interact with uh, with us or with Lori especially is if you click on text chat, 
you can type in comments that you all can then comment on and Lori can see and she can respond to. So if you have something specifically that you want to raise with Lori, uh, I know you would never disagree with anything that she says, okay, but if you question it, or you, um, you probably understand everything that she says anyhow, but uh, if you have another point of view or you want to add something to it, um, you know, click on text chat. That might be a good idea if you did that now and you just typed in one thing that you'd like to get out of tonight's conversation. Um, and again, the one person who can't see what you type in is me, uh, but uh, but Lori can and, and you all can. So that's one thing. Another thing is that if you have a microphone and you wanna come up because you have a question that you think needs a little bit more discussion than just asking a question, there's a raise hand item on the menu. And if you click on the raise hand item, then I can see that you're raising your hand and we can bring you up and you can directly talk with Lori on the screen um, and, you know, and, and get into a dialogue about whatever the question is, whatever you want to, to, to bring up. Uh, we've had a lot of people who have contributed extra ideas, extra examples, uh, questions that we never thought of. Um, you know with your students that the ones who are asking questions and contributing are the people who are learning the most. So we'd like to encourage you to do that. And then the, the third avatar is the ask question button. And the ask question button actually asks a question of me, but then I can direct it to Lori or, um, or I can display it so that everybody can see. So those are three ways of interacting um, a fourth way, if, if Lori, if we end up doing this, um, you know, where you ask people to break into small groups, I'll explain when we do that. But, uh, but I wanted to actually, to, to give that quick explanation of, of the Shindig platform, uh, now, you know, now that we have more people here and I'll let you go back. Um, we were talking about, uh, the two different narratives. Uh, the first narrative is that you know, technology is essential to our future. Second is that technology is detrimental to our children. And uh, you bringing up some statistics. You want me to move on to the next slide? Yeah, I think so. Um, so I think we'll skip this and then we'll we'll talk a little bit about the, the landscape. Um, and I encourage everybody, uh, if you have any questions, please, like uh, Mitch said, chime in and we'll, we'll make sure we address them. Um, with regard to those two big narratives that I'm observing, uh, there, there's also kind of the the landscape and kind of the the world that we're living in with regard to technology and a lot related to the digital divide. So I want to talk a little bit about that and as well as kind of how the two narratives are really being portrayed in the media. Um, so first of all, I want to talk a little bit about the digital divide. Uh, we see lots of information about that. Uh, but the truth is, is that there's a lot of competing information. So it used to be that the digital divide was about access to the machine. You know, do kids have computers? Do kids have devices? But, you know, as you can see on your screen, there's a little quote there from The Truth About Tech, which says nearly every child under eight in America has access to a mobile device at home and youth represent one in three Internet users worldwide which is amazing. Now, I do want to say that having access to a mobile device and having, you know, a quality computer that you can do really rich work on is different. Um, but just when you talk about access, uh, that's something. But it's not just about access now. It's also about um, access to broadband. Um, in fact, you know, Tom Wheeler, who is the FCC chairman, said uh, talks about E-rate devoting resources to schools and libraries related to getting access to robust broadband. Um, and But this is still an issue. We know that nearly one in four school districts still doesn't have sufficient bandwidth to meet the digital needs of students. So that's a really big issue. And by the way, I will bring up, he was the FCC chairman. The new yeah. FCC chairman has said that we basically have enough access and we should no longer be funding or at least no longer be funding to the same level libraries and schools to have access because they have more than enough. So well, uh, those of you um, who, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying I, I, I obviously if I'm in education, I disagree with that. But, but we, we know that E-rate is still a thing and we know that not everybody had, you know, I work with rural school districts. They don't have the same access um, as urban uh, and it's an ongoing issue. 
Yep. Um, okay, sorry, I deflected it. No, no, I'm so glad that you brought that up because <laughs> because that's that's a fair statement. Um, but we also know that it's not just about access; it's also about what you actually do with the technology. Um, it's about a digital use divide as well. Uh, it's not about just about what you can do, but about what you do do. And in particular in schools about teacher PD for digital tech. Um, so there was this article in Ed Week that talks about uh, the fact that teachers aren't necessarily coming out of college well prepared to use technology in schools. Uh, and that teachers in high poverty schools are consistently less likely than their counterparts to say they received uh, technology integration training. So that that's kind of a, an additional divide. Um, so, so those are some additional things. There are some other statistics uh, that 11.6 million students lack the minimum broadband bandwidth for digital learning, and 50% of teachers nationwide lack support to use tech in their schools. So there's additional digital divide things, but I want to watch this short little video here. Uh, it's put out in the interest of full disclosure, funded by Verizon. Uh, and I thought we could watch it. It talks a little bit about the digital divide and what that means for kids in our country. This is screen time without a net, that, that one, right? Yes, yes. Okay. The way that our robots work is our we have code on a laptop, on a laptop that we can then download onto the brain of the robot here. Today in school, I don't think I will use a computer at all. Our hopes for the future are very technology dependent. Not having internet has been difficult because most everything is internet based. So there's a lot more stress on the students to find a way to actually do their homework. It's just exciting knowing that I'm going to go to college, like my dream is coming true. We grew up living poor. We want to see what it's like to have a chance Yeah, I'm not that's promoting, pretty. But it's it gets your heart a little bit, right? Yeah, when you see the kids with the with with the access to digital and the kids that didn't have the access to digital, it um, it's very bothersome. It is. So I thought we could talk about that for a minute before we watch our next video. Um, I thought we could just talk about what you guys are observing. Um, are there any things that people want to kind of comment on or what you're yeah, seeing? Maybe, the divide? maybe you can put into your either raise your hand if you if you have a microphone and you're willing to come up and and talk with us. But uh, whether you are or not, maybe you can put it into the text box. I'll uh, decrease the size of this so you, you have a little bit more room to see that. But remember, the text box is uh, it's it's uh, you can open it up right under your avatar. Um, maybe. So what types of schools and communities are you coming from? Is it mostly communities that have high access, that have high disparities, uh, that don't have access? And uh, and what are you seeing? And, uh, and Lori, are you seeing people typing in? Um, maybe, I'm not seeing maybe anything. You can get it, OK, maybe you can get it started also, because maybe you can open up a text. Again, the one person who can't is me. <laughs> OK, so I. I do the participant thing and type Right, here. you go, yeah. I'm hoping everyone can see my little note that just said, hi, everyone. Um, one of the things that I, you know, I work with, I live in a very, um, I'm very lucky to live where I live. I live in a school district that has lots of resources. Um, hi, Ismari. Maybe you could, Ismari Cruz just commented, hello. So um, please tell us a little bit about what you experience, where you live or where you work. Um, but I, I personally work with school districts all over the country, um, some in very well-to-do areas, but mostly in areas that are um, have a lot of challenges uh, and don't necessarily have as many opportunities. So it, it's, a, it's a thing that I see a lot of. Yeah, I uh, very recently visited a, a school only about five miles away from where we live. Um, this was a, a school in Mount Vernon, uh, Mount Vernon, New York. And um, 
basically there were, you know, there was one computer in every classroom and the computers that I saw were at least four or five years old and, and old, you know, they weren't, they probably weren't particularly great. And, and uh, we were there to do a demonstration of, you know, really cool software that involved 3D design and aug in augmented reality. And we brought iPads for the kids to use. And it's, you know, and most of them could figure out how to use an iPad, but most of them did not have access to anything like that. And it was like, oh my gosh, you know, this is, uh, this, this is real America. This is, um, you know, we have, you know, in my mind, it's like, we, we have to do better than this. Anyhow, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Um, if nobody else has any of, oh, Lisa Olin just commented uh, that she's from Washington State in rural. They're experiencing a sudden change in behaviors in the district and are wondering if it is related to a lack of social interaction because students are on computers and phones so much. Students get much less feedback about how they are received through a screen instead of face-to-face -face play. Um, that is an excellent point and one of the things that I think we're going to um, address in our next video, uh, which is called Screenagers. Um, and as Mari said that she's from Puerto Rico, her school is a private school that serves middle, low class families. Many of the students do not have access to the internet at all, which speaks to my broadband issue. <laughs> um, and it is interesting. Uh, I, I was just at a Moorhead State University, which is a very small rural college in Kentucky. Um, yeah, Kentucky. And it, uh, it was it was interesting because I mean I had to go way way out and the student and I ended up being able to observe a teacher a student teacher it was a university um, teaching in a in a public school environment and it was so different from what I see in the urban environments. Um, so and I think I think that that issue of kids um, having different ways of interacting and not learning certain social ways um, it's it's actually. To my way, I think it's an issue that we've had for the last 20 or 30 years. And I mean, maybe forever, because maybe we're interacting with different people more. But um, a lot of those ways of interacting were inculcated from a whole family setting. And um, more and more kids aren't getting that from their families. And they're certainly not getting that from interacting with other kids as much because they're interacting electronically which is which is a lot less rich of an of an interaction so it's it i don't think we can just say oh this is a technology problem it's technology related but it's also an issue that uh, as a society we haven't come up with a way of building those values of interacting again um and we're and i think we're seeing schools starting to understand that if a kid isn't ready to learn, if they don't have their social and emotional intelligence, um, and if they don't, you know, if, if they don't ha have the growth mentality mm -hmm. with, you know, um, attitude, you. then it's, you know, that compounds the whole problem of, you can't just teach a kid math if the kid isn't, you know, doesn't have the um, executive function to be able to, um, you know, postpone gratification as an example. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's something I think, um, you know, it's interesting, like when we went back to one of our old, the, the old statistics we shared on an earlier slide about how the American Academy of Pediatrics doesn't want kid, you know, small children using technology at all, with the exception of video chat, which is interesting, because it helps create the family environment, even when families aren't nearby. So you can still have that social pseudo face-to-face -face interaction with a grandparent or with mm -hmm. a friend or with an uncle and actually at least get those social cues in a way that you wouldn't be able to without. So I think it's interesting that that's the exception they made, especially with regard to Lisa's comments about, you know, feedback from a screen. I'm sure she's not talking about video chat. She's talking about, right. you know, thing and, and all of that. So do you want me to queue up the next video? Yeah, yeah, let's take, cue that up. It's um, called Growing Up Digital, uh, Growing Up in the Digital Age. It's actually a, a trailer for a documentary that I actually went to see a screening of. Um, and it specifically focuses on the challenges of 
uh, digital screens and children. Uh, and I just, I thought it would be helpful to our conversation. Okay, well, here we go. Hopefully I, it's the right one. Yep. It's super fun playing on my mom's cell It's phone. awesome how you can watch videos on Texting YouTube. and sharing photos. Playing games on my phone. It all started with one question. What new phone to get my daughter? I knew what Tessa wanted, a smartphone. I learned that you spend on average six and a half hours a day looking at screens. As a doctor, I decided I needed to understand the impact of all this screen time on kids. And as a mom, I needed to know what to do. The young adolescent brain can oscillate back and forth very, very quickly, but it comes at a cost. I'm so distracted by my phone, so it's hard to listen to a teacher and actually understand what they're saying. What's extraordinary about the studies on multitasking is even though you're doing worse and worse on everything you're doing, you feel as though you're doing better and better. Who's there to catch you at home? Your mom? You can outsmart her easily. No, no offense. Yeah, mom, it's really hard mathing. The game industry has designed these games to become universes where these kids enter and they don't want to come out to do math. Who wants to do math? When I tried to stop him from playing the games, he turns into another person. I gamed until like one in the morning, and then I gamed three in the morning, and then I gamed until five in the morning. Most of the time, he'd be on the computer, it felt like he was in a different world. I didn't realize how much my sister cared about me. The thing that matters is not whether you're a good person, it's how you look. I took a picture of myself and my bra, and I sent it to him. When I got to school, I knew that everyone else knew. This is one of the most difficult parenting issues we've ever faced. Internet consumption, video game use is very complicated to parent around. The mistake that parents often make is that they assert their authority without explaining it in a way that makes sense to their child. When parents tell me not to do something, I'm like, what would happen if I did it? When my parents actually have that deep conversation, it works a lot better. It's evolution, it's the future, it's too late, I'm addicted. No, it's not too late. The research that shows human resiliency gives me hope. My friends and I go out to eat. We'll all agree to put our phones in the middle of the table. Whoever checks their phone first has to pay for the meal. When I study, I turn off the data on my phone, and that way I can't go on the internet, and I can't get text messages. We have to think about everywhere that kids are in the real world and how we can help educate them in those spaces. We can't just say it's on the schools, it's on the parents. We have to do this as a community. So that was that was that was another in, in, interesting video. I love the one. Um, my, my mom's easy to fool. No, no offense to intended, right? Yeah, and we are easy to fool. <laughs> dads, um, though, dads, though. Yeah. I mean, we we see go through all of it, right? Definitely, definitely. You're right. <laughs> um, we had a few other comments. One, Ismari said it's an important issue since we face some situations with students, and Ismari is from um, uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, situation with students who fail to follow social rules and etiquette using social networks and chats, all related to, I mean, that's all related to digital um, citizenship, really. Uh -huh. uh, and then Lisa said, she agrees with you, Mitch, on missing social skills support from families, but she said she sees parents on phones too in public and restaurants. We've just felt a bigger change this year for all ages, not just secondary. Uh, and she said she's in a low income community. Hmm. Uh, so I'm curious, so, what, what do people think no, about that video? And are we, are you feeling like that represents kind of what you're seeing at all? Or are there kind of challenges that you're experiencing associated with that? What do you think, Mitch? Well, it again, we're seeing the kids on the machines so much more than, than previous, than, than even four or five years ago. So, um, so I think that's one big change. The second big change is we're seeing, I mean, multitasking was always an issue, but attention spans are getting smaller and smaller, I say, because um, kids are so used to multitasking. And I love the statement that, um, that uh, 
assessments are showing that we're getting worse, that, the, you know, we get worse and worse at things the more we multitask, but internally, we feel that we're, that we're getting better and better at things when we multitask. So, so a question in my mind is, how do we reconcile that with all of us? How do we get all of us to understand that by multitasking above a certain amount, um, we're actually getting we're less productive than more productive. It's a hard one. It's a hard one for adults, let alone for children. Right. Um, at least it's hard for me. Uh, if we go to the next slide, one of the other things I kind of want to point out, and this is the last kind of digital divide thing we're going to talk about, but I wanted to put it out there because it's it's along the lines of uh, of some of the things, the two different narratives that we're hearing that. You know, we need kids to be more digitally savvy, et cetera. But then we also have the other that kids, um, it, it's not really about that. We need to kind of step back. But there was this recent op-ed uh, in the New York Times that, that really made me think it's by Naomi Riley. And I'm just going to quote her. This is what she said. If you think middle class children are being harmed by too much screen time, just consider how much greater the damage is to minority and disadvantaged kids who spend much more time in front of screens. According to a 2011 study by researchers at Northwestern, minority children watch 50% more TV than their white peers and use computers for up to one and a half hours longer each day. White children spend eight hours and 36 minutes looking at a screen every day, while black and Hispanic children spend 13 hours. Wow. Uh, and she, yeah, huge, <laughs> right? And she said, too often the message we send low income and less educated parents is that screen time is going to help their children but no one is telling poor parents about the dangers of screen time. So that's what I meant when I was talking a little bit about a backlash uh, a while ago, Mitch, when we were talking. And I, uh, it, it's a dangerous and kind of touchy subject. I'm a huge proponent of ed tech. I think it, that's what I do. I promote ed tech and, uh, and, and do research on it uh, in schools uh, and program evaluation. But uh, there, there's a divide here and I'm seeing it more and more. Uh, and I think it. what happens is that ultimately what the big question is that what does that ultimately mean for schools? When schools are constantly under this pressure to do more and more with technology and uh, not just the rich technology, but even the parking kids in front of screens so they can just work through content technology. Um, and then, but then you have parents in different kind of uh, experiences saying, no, it's too much, or other parents saying, no, I want more. What does that all mean? How does that shake out for schools? And that's what I wanted to talk about. Okay. So we should advance the slide so we can talk yeah, about it, right? It. So, okay. tell me, friends, how do you experience the digital divide in your schools? And what do you think this means for children in schools? These two narratives and how they kind of run parallel to each other, but maybe conflict. And it's interesting because I'm thinking about uh, some of my nieces and nephews who have kids and some of them are sitting down with their kids and they're doing stuff on the computer the way when when we had kids, when I had kids, um, we would sit down with books with them. Um, yeah. And then we, I have other nieces and nephews who have kids where the computer is kind of their babysitter. And so they know the kid's going to be quiet if they give the kid their laptop or, or the kid's laptop even worse, um, while they can go and do their whatever their adult things are. So it's, it's it, and it isn't totally one way or, or, or the other way, but they're, you know, they tend to skew towards um, the two, you know, one, one group using the computer as just another way to spend time with the kid and, and the other group, the computer is the replacement so that, so that I can do what I want to. Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering how many people in the audience have seen those two events skewed also. And this is not by economics because these are nephews and nieces who are coming from similar backgrounds. I mean, I can tell you myself, I do both. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm certainly not immune to it myself. I think I, I can't imagine any of us are at all. Uh, but it is an interesting thing. Um, and when you talk about low income families, uh, especially in areas where there aren't as many uh, after school programs and resources uh, and, you know, safe parks for kids to play in and 
all of and you know funding for for different experiences it's really hard mm -hmm. elisa said perseverance is very difficult for many of our students without constant stimulation students struggle to stick with tasks that take continued effort i've seen both si sides of mitch's example yeah, yeah. Stick yeah, to it and, and it's, hard. it's hard to kind of keep them going with that growth mindset. Well, and the uh, again, you have the people who are building the commercial programs and the commercial systems who are employing people who are expert at um, at motivation and mani mm -hmm. and manipulation. So they're building things in so that the kids at very young ages, um, you know, Yes, they're keeping with it, but it's kind of like they're keeping with it because they, they, they keep on getting extrinsic rewards or even intrinsic rewards. It's just um, you do this. OK, here's your reward. You do this. OK, here's your reward. But then the real things that have that, you know, in the real world uh, where you don't have that constant simulation, you don't have that constant uh, those constant rewards. Um, you know, the, the kids don't have the grit. They may not have the grit out, out, outside, and yet we see when the kids are playing difficult games, there is some, there is a transfer of grit. So when a when a kid is building, when a kid learns how to stick with Minecraft, as an example, and build really intricate designs, um, those skills of sticking with something then are able to be transferred. But when they're sticking with Candyland and they're doing what I would consider relatively mindless things, but just getting the rewards, mm -hmm. that they're not building the grit when they're doing those types of operations. Which is interesting because one of the, the you, you can change the slide if you want it, it, it doesn't matter that much, but it all goes back to is all screen, in my opinion, is all screen time created equal? Um, so it's not just about the amounts, it's about the what. So what are we doing with the, let's say there are limits and we come up with some sort of the perfect, we'll never do this, but let's say we came up with the perfect amount of time for kids to spend on screens. What are we gonna do with that amount of time? Um, and if you look at your screen, you'll see like we, and I got this from an, another website, which I forgot to cite, but I can tell you, um, but it goes from the passive media all the way to the active media. Um, and you know, TV is all the way over there, right? Uh, and even this whole Ed Chat Interactive, what you know this is, you say it's about it's not talking heads anymore it's about you know some we're somewhere on this spectrum we're probably somewhere to the right of center on this on this spectrum uh, there's been a few other little comments here i want to say uh ismari said that she understands your point in her home reading a book was a daily routine but now that her son is 14 years old he prefers his phone or computer um huh. and then she said that parents tell her the same. Sometimes she worries that moving to eBooks or digital book is promoting some more screen time. Um, and it's interesting, I did have one quote or one statistic that I didn't share earlier. It was a college one. And it said, it was an organization that did a study to explore college students' ability to comprehend information from screens or on paper. And it discovered that students preferred reading to- Ah. Laura, you locked. Game to was better. However, the mm -hmm. data showed that their comprehension was better when they did it on paper. Um, not necessarily for general kind of content questions, but really kind of comprehension rich questions. They did better um, on the print media. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. And then Susan or Lisa said, to kids, multitasking probably sounds like a great skill. But much recent neuroscience research tells us that the brain doesn't do multiple tasks at once. We switch back and forth quickly, but may not learn to concentrate. And that goes to that 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 statistic regarding or that study regarding attention. And so my impression is that it that um, it's a little bit of an oversimplification when we say we don't multitask because there's the brain has multiple parts. So. It's kind of like you can walk and talk because really different parts of the brain are doing those things, um, and and so um, so we can multitask for the right types of things. But there's a a, a lot of the cognitive um, load 
that the computer uses takes away from the cog or that it, it, a lot of the things that we think we're multitasking, we're using the same, you know, um, cognitive processes. So it increases the cognitive load. So we're less able to do each particular task. Yeah. But the, the, the most, I love that video, you mentioned this, but the video, um, that second one, Growing Up Digital, how it talked about how we're doing worse and worse at each task overall, but we feel like we're doing better, yeah. which is super hard because that's what that's what the Center for Humane Technology is talking about. The the behaviorists and 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 all of those people they know that, um, so they they build technologies to constant like there, there's a finite amount of attention that any person can give. And all of these different technologies want their piece of that attention pie. So they're doing everything they can to grab the attention. Um, and, and it becomes this kind of, you know, everybody's upping the game and, um, and drawing as much as they can. And it becomes addictive, especially for children whose brains are developing. I mean, at least our brains are theoretically developed. <laughs> right. um, but theirs are very plastic. So it's a challenge. And I, I think ultimately the big question isn't um, so what, it's what now? Um, I, I would argue that both those narratives are true. The future is about technology, we have to deal with it. However, we also know that there are challenges for children related to technology use. So what do we do with that information in order to leverage the best of technology to help kids grow and learn, but not uh, send them down the wrong path. That's my, and that's you my have, argument. And, and you have the answer, right? I, I, you have the answer to that question. No, wait, I thought, I thought Ismari <laughs> had the answer. <laughs> or at least, Ismari said for years, multitasking was a work requirement, but it, like Lisa and Mitch say, one cognitive action will stop in order to work on with another cognitive task. And Lisa said, is this hyperstimulation causing more ADHD types of behavior? And that's a good question, Lisa. I, I don't know. I know that there's research to say that there that that video games and TV can contribute to attention challenges. It didn't say ADHD per se. You know, that's a clinical diagnosis. But ADHD types of behavior, maybe. I don't know. It just talked about attention um, and being able to stick with a task. So and there's a difference between video games too, because again, you play Candy yeah. Crusher. You know, and that you can play, it's kind of like solitaire. I mean, you can play yeah. um, without really concentrating. Um, but on the other hand, it is taking, you know, some of a cognitive load. Or you can play something like, uni I think it's called Universe Sandbox, where mm -hmm. you're building a, a rocket ship and figuring out the components of the rocket ship that are going to escape uh, Earth's gravitational field, get through the atmosphere, and land on Mars without crashing. And that, that involves math and, and planning and a, a lot of other thought processes. So so that type of a game, I would think, would build concentra concentration, grit, um, scientific skills, um, you know, ac di different academic skills, whereas the, um, the chiclet games, um, you know, really detract from your ability to concentrate and your ability to interact with people. I mean, it's, it's, I believe technology is a tool. We've been saying this for a million years. It's not inherently right. good or bad. Um, I think it's not about, and this guy, um, Scott Trailer and Ed Surge commentary said, it's not about setting time limits on screen time. It's about setting limits on certain types of screen-based activities. Um, and that technology is the continuum. And he said, you know, this was a neat one. He said, watching a YouTube clip is different from programming a robot to shoot a basketball. There are different technology-based activities. Um, it's not just about screens. So mm -hmm. I, you know, it, one of the things, if you go to the next slide, um, the whole now what slide, uh, you know, we're coming up on, on an hour, so I know we have to go, but if anybody ends up theoretically wanting to take this back and think about it some more, um, Mitch and I came up, well, mostly Mitch came up with a few different areas that we think that we could ultimately address in the future. Uh, and really think about it. I would love to think about these more, which is, you know, communication with families so that families have all the information they need um, to make, you know, really good, solid decisions for themselves and their children at, in their own homes regarding 
technology use, meaning like the how and the what, and the amount of time out of school. And then ultimately as teachers and researchers and educators, we wanna decide the amount of time we're using and how we're using it in schools, especially related to access, disparities in access, use, and time. So those are the six big things. Um, Ismari also says research demonstrates that can, that can cause a deficit in attention, but ADHD is a neurological brain wiring that differs from the typical brain. Um, so that's that was uh, Ismari's comment to Lisa, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, so we and I have a question about that. I have a question about that too, because you know they, we talk about plasticity in the brain, and that was in one of the videos also. So could this be triggering? Could some of the things that we do with computers be triggering the brain to develop? in ways that are more likely um, manifest as ADHD? I, and I have no idea. No, no, it's just, good question. It's just a question. It's a legit question. Um, so that's it, that's everything, That that's all my slides. Uh, you know, it, it, except for the very last one, which was my, the final two questions. You know, what can we do to ensure that technology is used well in schools? I mean, we're all educators. I'm sure we're all familiar with the gamut of technology um, and the really rich ways in which it can be used. So what can we do to be, sh be sure that we're moving in that direction? And then maybe what technologies are you using that have been most meaningful for you or your students? Yeah, and I'll just say that for me, um, the, the technologies that allow students to get involved with design thinking and computational thinking and and then second and then additionally collaborate with others to use design thinking and computational thinking in order to solve problems while they're learning those are the things that to me are the most powerful for learning well that's on that SAMR model over there in that fourth quadrant for sure uh -huh. Uh, as Mari said, do you have any information about research regarding recommended screen time in a school day? Um, and I don't. Uh, I can look it up, uh, and I, I think I might have seen something, but there's really not a lot of research about specific amounts of time during school day um, that, that I have seen. It would be an interesting question, uh, but I think it's, again, it's because... not screen time, because if you're talking about the things you're talking about, Mitch, that's not screen mm -hmm. time. Right, right. They may be in front of a screen, but it's a different. It's a different than when you're just giving kids, you know, what what we call chocolate flavored, chocolate flavored broccoli or chocolate coated block broccoli type things, where they're doing, you know, quizzes, but they're dressed up as if they're games. You know, I yeah. I think there's there's a, a a much smaller limit to the amount that that does any good. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Um, other questions or comments from people here? And I have to, you know, I know I I disagreed with a couple of things that some of you have said. I was hoping to provoke conversation, um, and I hope that the way I I I, I said those things wasn't um, that I that I did it in a professional manner. And if I didn't, then let me know. I thought it was great. You really pushed our thing, or at least my thinking in a lot of ways. Right. I appreciate and I appreciate the people who joined us today. Those are really good questions. I'm gonna look into the ADHD question uh, that that uh, Lisa and Mitch kind of talked about. And as Mari, I'm gonna look into um, recommended screen time uh, use in school. So thank you for those questions. Okay, thank you. And and we'll be recording this so so uh, and we'll let you know when it's up. So um, if you have people that you think should see this, uh, you can let them know about the archive. Um, and maybe let them know about some of the other events that we have coming up. Uh, you know, the site www.edchatinteractive.org. Um, and, you know, maybe you want to get involved. Um, I think in two weeks, we're having a session on game based learning. I don't know how many of you know Matt Farber, but he's um, he's an author um, and university professor right now. Um, 
And he has been working with a lot of us in game-based learning that we call ourselves the tribe. So there's going to be a few of us in the tribe who are talking about how we've seen games work in schools. And Matt's going to be challenging us to come up with um, why that's worked, how that's worked, and, and what teachers should be doing with games or should not be doing with games. So that's coming up in, in two weeks. And then we're having, um, I just forgot her name, um, uh, but uh, one of the national organizations who's um, advocating the use of more open education resources. And she's going to be talking about how different schools are using open education resources and to a certain extent using those to replace textbooks um, for better learning because now they can concentrate on kids doing things rather than kids reading and taking quizzes. So I think that's going to be a good ses session also. So both of those are edchatinteractive.org and uh, upcoming events. And Lori, thank you. Thank um, you. As always, um, you, you, you know, you, you always come up, you know, we, we probably talk two or three times a year and whenever we talk, you have really inf interesting information. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Okay. okay. Well, uh, this is Mitch Weisberg. I'm going to sign off. Uh, good night and hope to see you all at a future event.